Okay, it is Wednesday, May 10th. We're picking up in Genesis Bereshit, chapter 21. We're approximately looking at verse 19 and 20, even though we did at the end of last week, and we'll move forward from there. We are at the time when Hagar and Ishmael, mother and son, are being cast out of Abraham's family. The, the inner struggle, the inner conflict, I can't just call it a struggle, the inner fighting was so great that they're needing to split ways. This disturbed Abraham because that's also his son. But God spoke to him and said, what Sarah, your wife, is telling you to do, listen to her. Do it. The son of promise is not Ishmael. I will make a great nation out of him. In fact, he makes 10 nations come from him. We looked at that last time. We'll see it coming up, so I won't repeat it right at this moment. But he, he still was not the son of promise. He was not the son that the Messiah would come through and the line that would continue on down would not be through Ishmael, but it would be through Yitzhak. We saw last week that Hagar and her son were what's done in the flesh. And it's a picture of law that cannot save. It can only point us to seeing how our faults and our inability to be pleasing to God. We see in Yitzhak, we see promise. We see that God did it all. Sarah was as good as dead. Abraham as good as dead. Out of them come this life. That's our God who can bring life out of death. So we saw the great contrast. And again, we'll still probably talk a bit about that in the future. But in verse 19, as Hagar has gone out and she thinks that, that her son is dying in the wilderness, probably close to heat stroke, she thinks she's going to watch him die. She casts him under a, a bush for some shade and she cries out, don't let her see her son die. He apparently is crying out too because we saw in the scripture God heard his cries and yet he opens mama's eyes and he helps Hagar see that what she should have known because God had promised to her when she had run off many years earlier, didn't even know she was pregnant. He told her you're pregnant and he told her about the future of her son. So she should have been able to stand on that at this point in time and say, well, he's not going to die because God, you haven't fulfilled yet your word that you've promised. And I know you're faithful. She should have learned that in Abraham's house. But apparently at this moment, she had a moment of weakness in whatever faith she did have. But yet God is the faithful one. And God provided, opened her eyes to see a well of water. Water in scripture, the, the water of life is a picture to us of Yeshua Jesus. So Again, we're seeing the double meaning in here that God is always there, that he is ready to supply, that he could bring to her water of life in the middle of the desert, and that he's bringing life to us no matter where we are when we come drink at his well. She didn't have to exert herself. She didn't have to go far. She didn't have to dig the well, which would have been an impossibility, but God was sufficient in supplying all and all that was needed. So uh, again, we see the great contrast in our faith and drinking at the well and when we're trying to be on our own and do it our own way. And the one thing God had said about Ishmael when he told the future, he did say that Ishmael was going to be one that would be contentious with his brothers, one who wasn't going to get along, one who was of a rebellious nature. He was not causing Ishmael to be that way. He was calling out what he knew because he knows the future from the beginning. And so he just told it as it is. You're going to have this up, but this is what his demeanor is going to be like. And we see that in verse 20, where we see that he's very much a man of the flesh. We say God was with the boy. He grew. And remember, we saw boy does not mean a little boy. That in the Hebrew, that language is used up until the person is married. We see that, that you know, the young men are still called boys. It's the same word in our Hebrew. It's the same way that I hear a 90-year-old mama call her 70-year-old son kid. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't mean he was little. But he did continue to grow. He, he, we saw that he had to be, um, Yitzhak had to be, um, what was it, 15 by now? We, we saw, I'm sorry, Ishmael had to be 15 at least by now, um, probably closer to 19, because we can look from the time, the age when um, he was circumcised, the age when Isaac was born, then Yitzhak had to be weaned, and then this happened. So we know there had to have been a period of time. So at the, the least, he's in mid to late teens, at the least. So he continues 
he comes into adulthood, he lives in the wilderness. Now, wilderness doesn't mean there's nothing around. It's desert. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. We see that that uh, they they lived life, of course, by God's supply. But wilderness doesn't mean they never saw another human being. No, uh, it, we do find out he's going to marry and his mom's going to pick his wife for him, which was typical then. It's not that he was necessarily mama's boy, because I don't see that. But she picks a wife for him from Egypt. Egypt's where she probably came from. She probably went back to familiar territory and found a pretty little girl and said, hmm, you know, we like this one. And the marriage came about that his character, we see in the fact that it says he became an archer. An archer indicates a hunter. And usually when that's used in scripture in this way, it's not a good connotation. It's not just meaning that he was, he hunted for his livelihood, but it, it's speaking to being a, a fighter for himself rather than on God's side. Um, living and dwelling in the wilderness, in the desert area. His descendants are the Arabs, and we still see many of them in the desert areas today. That's what I'm trying to say. Populations grew there. It wasn't deserted. It just was that what the area was called. And in fact, verse 21 tells us a bit more. Uh, I have to find it here. Go. He, he lived in the wilderness of Paran. Now we've got a name. That tells us where we know from our maps that that's the Sinai Desert, Sinai, for those of you who are used to hearing it that way. This would have been the northeastern part that was south of Beersheba. So you, where I'm telling you north and east, you're still south of Beersheba. Beersheba is the area where we're going to have our next story take place. We're going to see Beersheba in scripture. It speaks about southern Israel. So we're looking at southern Israel. We're headed down toward Egypt, and it would be above Egypt. That's why we're still north. It would be a little more east, uh, which would take us uh, away from the Mediterranean. You know, it's going toward Jordan, you know, but below in on the map. hope I didn't confuse you all. Just know it's south of, of Beersheba because you can find Beersheba or Beersheba, as you may call it, easily on the map. And knowing this also, the Hebrew meaning to this word is beauty or glory. So there was a beauty in the wilderness, a beauty in this desert area. And we know that to this day, there are those who love the desert beauty and choose to live in it. So it's not that he just got banished to, you know, Timbuktu and, and God didn't care. No, no, he, he, it was wonderful for him. In fact, it's in this area later that Moshe, Moses, sees God's glory. I wonder if that's even how the name came to mean that. Don't know, but anyway. Um, it's the last we're going to hear of Ishmael until his father, Abraham, dies. That's in chapter 25, verse 9. He'll be at his father's burial. Almost said funeral. Let's go for burial. <laughs> okay, picking up with our new content now completely, we're starting into verse 22. And it says, now it came about at that time. Okay, so we're probably in close proximity to what has just been given to us. It's not way separate, but time's moving on. Abimelech, Abimelech, we know that name because we know that um, Abraham came down into Abimelech's area, was afraid that they take his wife to get his wife because she was so beautiful. So he told his wife, tell her tell anyone I'm your brother, you're my sister. He, that's what they did. Abimelech took her into his harem before he could touch her. God gave him a heathen king a dream. God could mm -hmm. speak even to the unsafe in their dreams, and he did. And he told him, You're a dead man if you touch her. And so Abimelech did not. He respected the God that he heard this dream from. He called Abraham out on it, he called Sarah out on it, said, Hey. Why did you do this? And then it, he gave her back to Abraham with gifts that showed the value of a person that she wasn't being given back and forth like a slave. It was showing that she had not been disgraced. He had not touched her. That was important because had he, then no one could say definitely who Yitzhak's father was, that there was no kind of touching, no, no sexual relationship that had come into the picture at all. So there is absolutely no doubt who the father of Yitzhak is. 
and Abimelech also blessed Abraham with, with gifts and told him, live wherever you want. So that's where we left him off. Now we're picking back up with the same one again. And his uh, chief captain, commander, his general of his army, so to speak, Fikal, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name right. In Hebrew, it looks like Pichol. Sounds a little better to me. But anyway, that's personal choice. <laughs> These two came together. They came to speak to Avraham. Okay, he's bringing his army with him when he's coming to speak to Avraham. He's not coming alone. He's coming with a representative of his might and his power. And he's doing this probably because this time, this is going to be a public um, uh, episode. Sure. Showing? Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's public <laughs> demonstration. Okay, last time it was only Avi Malik's family that was in the picture. He did bring his whole household together when he called out Abraham and Sarah for doing wrong, and probably because it was going to affect the whole household. Not only would he be dead, but his household would also suffer the consequences and it be brought to nothing too. So all who were involved, he did bring into that picture, but he didn't take Abraham out to the to the area, the people who were living there and put him on display there. But here he's coming openly. He's coming um, not privately because this is going to be a public alliance. This is going to be a coming together. That's his intent. Yes. So they meet again? Yes. For the second time? Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. Abraham's been living his life out in the area nearby. We'll kind of get a little better um, uh. that as we move. Yeah. A little while because everything is a child. Now Abraham's continuing on. He's got his attention on one son, one son only, the son of promise. And Avi Malik comes back into the picture. So uh, what we're going to see in verses 23 and 24 apparently is like a military treaty, a peace treaty of sorts. What we're seeing and what we're to understand is Avi Malik feared Abraham's power. He saw a great man and he saw great power and he feared him because of his God. Remember, he had respect for Abraham's God right from his dream. But this is fulfillment of what God said to Abraham all the way back in chapter 12. In chapter 12 and verse 3, he told him that he would make his name great. Well, we're beginning to see the fulfillment of that. Abraham had a great name. He's very wealthy. He's very strong. He's powerful. And Abimelech's going, hmm, I don't want there to be any ill feelings, ill will between us. I want peace between the two of us. So he comes to him to talk to him. He's being wise, I think, <laughs> you know, that he sees the potential, and he's calling it out before it is, and he's wanting it to be friendly. He's not coming with the army. He's just coming with a representative saying, I'm strong. I've got something to offer. You're strong. You've got something to offer. Let's make a peace treaty here. Then we can know that we're there for each other and not at each other. So verse 23, um, actually, I've told you the meaning of verse 22, but I didn't read it. They came to Abraham, spoke to him, saying, God is with you in all that you do. See, so he realized your God is blessing you. Your God is with you. I don't want to have any problem with your God or with you. So now, verse 23, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my descendants. But according to the kindness that I've shown to you, before I go any farther, let me back up right there. Don't deal falsely with me. Why did he say that to Abraham? Because of Go ahead. His, his wife. Because Abraham dealt with him falsely about Sarah. Yep. So he had a right to think that, hey, don't come lying to me again. Don't pull any fast ones. <laughs> Let's speak truth here. Let's lay our cards on the table. Now, in doing that, and I'm asking you, be honest with me. I want you to be with me, my offspring, my descendants. In other words, I'm not just worried about now I'm looking out for my progeny. Yes. Isn't that where, where uh, Sarah gets her, I mean, the maid from him the first time? No, she got Hagar when they went down into Egypt. Oh. That was before they were in Gerard. Oh. So she didn't have, um, in fact, Ishmael was, was, 
Yeah, Ishmael, they got Ishmael when he gives Sarah up because he, one year before Isaac's born is when Abraham meets Avimelech and gives Sarah into his harem. Okay, that's just a year before Yitzhak is born. So Ishmael is about 12 years old. So, okay. yeah, um, Hagar came when they went down into Egypt. He made the same mistake twice. He went down into Egypt looking for sustenance instead of trusting God. And he comes back with Hagar. And we know what happens after that. So that's why we believe she's Egyptian, because that's when she comes into the picture. Then a little later in time, 12 years later in time, God gives him the same test. Are you going to trust me now? And again, he goes down, he heads toward Egypt, doesn't get as far as Egypt, only gets as far as Gerar, which is south of Beersheba, north of Egypt, but in that area. And he fears again, does the same thing, just like in Egypt. Sarah, they're going to kill me. They're going to want you. Lie for me. You know, only it's not really a lie because we've got the same mama. We just don't have the same daddy. So you're only my half sister. So, you know, just but a half, a half lie to conceal the, the truth is a whole lie. You it's know? still a sin. It, yes, yes. And God calls him out on it. Uh, and and then, it's sin. Yeah. Sin, not son. Yes. <laughs> uh, but again, God protected Sarah, protected his promise, protected his plan. He does, doesn't leave it up for chance. You know, man will mess up. God stays in control. <laughs> okay. So we've got those episodes. Went down to Egypt, came up with Hagar, has Ishmael, goes down to Gerard. God stops it right there. A year later, Yitzhak is born. But we know because nothing happened here that it wasn't, Avimelech is not Yitzhak's daddy. No paternity test needed, no nothing needed. We know where Yitzhak comes from. And Yitzhak was not virgin born, not like Miriam gives birth to Messiah, Mashiach, who had no earthly father. Yitzhak had an earthly father. God rejuvenated his body, Abraham's. God rejuvenated Sarah's womb and brought them together and they produced a son. Still miraculous, but it's not virgin born. There's only one that's been virgin born. And he had to be because he couldn't have an earthly father. Then he would have had the sin nature within him. He would have been 100% uh, human. He would not have been divine and human 100% each at, at the time of his birth in his life. So are we clear? Okay, then let's see what happens when Avimelech says, hey, don't pull a fast one on me. Don't deal falsely with me. Speak only truth with me. And I don't want it just with me, but I want this with my offspring. I want this with my descendants. Do it according to the kindness, I'm in verse 23 again, that I've shown to you. You shall show to me and to the land in which you have resided. Okay, Avi Melech blessed Abraham when he sent him out. When he told him, take your wife. He gave him um, other blessings. Also, let's look real quick. That's chapter 20. So you can get there just by turning your page back. And verse 14 and 15. And I've got my tablet coming up with a commercial. Okay. Oh, my batteries are going down. Okay. So he's yeah. switching out batteries while I move to. There we go. Sorry. Oh, and there I'm off. I think I'm loud enough for the moment. In chapter 20 and verse 14, Avimelech then took sheep and oxen, male and female servants, and gave them to Abraham and returned his wife Sarah to him. So um, Avimelech gave Abraham a lot. You know, sheep, oxen, male servants, female servants, and Sarah. Thank you. Oh, oh okay. He's still trying to. I can't get it to go in. Okay, so he's he's saying, I was kind to you. Yeah, that was 20 and verse 14. So now going back into chapter 21. <laughs> that's why I will read it to you when I say it. If I, you know, I either summarize it or read it. Okay. Am I going to get another commercial? I cannot get my tablet to cooperate. And I stick with it because the pages are so loud on the microphone. If I use my Bible, that that's why I've got the tablets because I understand for those listening to recordings, it's a lot easier on the ears. So sorry, folks. I can't live with technology and I can't live without it. And I thank the Lord for Roger who helps me make it with it. Okay. 
So Avi Malik saying, I dealt with you kindly. Now deal with me kindly the same way. Let's, let's make this work. So I'm back in verse 23. I think I'm headed for 24. Chapter 21. Okay, and verse 23 still, according to kindness I've shown you, we just read about it, you shall show to me and to the land in which you have resided. Remember, Abimelech told him, go out, you know, go away from us. You're not a part of us. He, Abraham was nomadic. He didn't have a land that was his own. He couldn't say, go back home, go back to your own property. Home was, would have been back in Mesopotamia. We know Abraham has been wandering through the land that God told him he was to sojourn through. That's what a sojourner does. But Adi Malik said, you can live wherever you want, you know, in my jurisdiction. So remember, he had a lot of area, a lot of jurisdiction, um, probably a little more than a mayor. But we're not he, when it says king, it doesn't mean like a king of England. It, it's just it is a, a large um, rulership, a large area that he's over. So um, I failed to say, is it right here right now still? Um, how to keep losing my place? Sorry. Okay. Um, Rochelle, and how many years between when uh, he and Lot parted ways? Uh, I'm not Lot. thinking of anything that tells me the time. Um, let me go back and see if I can find oh, okay. for, for something. Sure. Well, that's, that's a good question. I, in my mind, it wouldn't have been too long after he and Lot parted because once Lot was gone out of the picture, now God's got Abraham alone for the first time since he's brought him from Mesopotamia. And the promise was to Abraham and to his descendants that's going to come through Yitzhak and on. So it's like he weeded out everything that was in the way. And then here we go. So I don't think it was too long. Oh, you're giving me another tablet to try. <laughs> I don't know if it'll help, but next time I have trouble, I'll switch over to it. Would you say that they had the same mother, uh, Sarah and Abraham? Yeah. Is, Is it the same mama or the same papa? One of their one twelve. Of, uh, read Genesis twenty twelve, which says, "Read it for us." Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father. Okay, thank um, you. I reversed it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate you saying corrected. Genesis twenty and verse twelve. Sarah was had the same father as Abraham. I think I did say mama a few minutes ago, and I would not put it past me to flip it. So <laughs> thank you very much. That as it was coming out of me, I was kind of wondering, but I was rattling on. Okay, lots to now. We'll see if I can get better on the timeline. I might be able to find something specific that I'm just not remembering. But in my mind, not, not real long, especially because we're seeing the age of Yitzhak and, and Ishmael. <clears throat> um, when God appears to Abraham in chapter 20, the three appear. It's a year later that Yitzhak is born. So it's going to be at least that long because Lot has to be out of the picture. We don't know how fast after Sodom and Amorah are destroyed that chapter 20. That's where I've got to see if I find anything that gives me time right in there. Chapter um, 20? Yeah, it, it would have to be right after Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Oh, oh, and, exactly. and then how soon did God appear to Abraham after that? Nothing in my mind's clicking right now. Um, I've got timelines I can look at. I've got one that's room-sized, <laughs> and I'll go, go look in the scripture. So if there is anything, I'll try to either tag it onto this video or next class um, I'll be answering for the people that are live anyway. So we've moved a little down anyhow into time. And when we see that all of the Melech said that God is with you in all that you do, we see the presence of God in Abraham's life. That's his greatest blessing. His greatest blessing isn't the sheep and the oxen and the this and the that. His greatest blessing is that God is in his life. God's directing his life. God's protecting his life. God's producing through his life. That's what we want also. That's the greatest of all blessings. And every single one of us has that opportunity to have the presence of God in our lives. And if we put our lives in his hand, we will be blessed. We were just learning about the character of God and his heart, how he pursues. 
Oh, and my. even when we fall short, you know, it's the same with, with Abraham. Yes. Look how we come to fall short, and yet God is merciful. He had a plan. He wasn't going to let go of it. Right. And right. That really shows God's grace, God's mercy that whoever he's got planned with, he's going to hang on to you. Absolutely. And that you, you said it the right way too. He hangs on to us. <laughs> yeah. And it is love. It's unconditional love. It is undying love. It is grace. It is mercy. And we could go on and on. And I see that. And if I even get as far as I thought I would get in this lesson, we will be before we get to the end talking more about that great love of God. It's just takes my breath away when I Wow, let's get there. <laughs> so in, in as we move on then in verse um, 23, we're reminded that he showed to he showed to Avi Melek also that remember even the land you're residing in, I told you, you know, live wherever you want. I didn't, you know, kick you out. I've shown you great graciousness, is what he's saying. So uh, Abraham in verse 24 answers and says, I swear it. He's saying, basically, I'm agreeing to it. Yes, you know, let's let's make an alliance together. But there's a but in here. <laughs> Abraham in verse 25 says, but Abraham complained to Abimelech because of the well of water, which the servants of Abimelech had seized. Okay, the Hebrew says they'd taken it violently. They'd taken this well violently. It was unjust. It was not in Avi Malik's territory. So they really had no right. Avi Malik was over a lot of the territory, but by now Avram has moved in an area that this, and we're going to see because of the contention of the well, that this well did not belong to Avi Malik. In fact, it's me to read the final chapters, you know, and come back. Go down to verse 30 real quick, and it tells I'm done. It wasn't there. It wasn't that Abraham came into Avi Melech's well and was using his well, and Avi Melech's people, the men, took it back. No, this was Abraham's well. He had dug it with his own hands and with his own people, and yet it has now been unjustly seized. Now, remember, we're in the desert. We're not in a rainy, mountainous, greeny, flowery area. We're not in Oregon. We're in Palm Desert, okay? <laughs> and so a well is very important. Uh, it's not something to be taken lightly. It's something that would be needed. And it's not something that's that's easily done. That's a lot of work. Now, Canaan, the area that we call Israel now, but Canaan at that time, Canaan, it didn't have significant rivers. There was a great reliance on the rain. They, that's why you see so many... Um, uh, cisterns, you know, where they learned how to channel the rain and, and catch the rain and then hold it so that they would have it in when there wasn't any rain coming at all. Uh, and that would make a property that has a well, has a cistern, anything like that, but especially a well where they've got water regularly from, that would make it very valuable property. So this was something that uh, uh, was, it, it, this isn't just a, picking a little fight over something little. Abraham had a right to bring his attention. Hey, I will deal right, right with you, but you need to know your men have stolen my well. I dug this. I worked it. I need it. They took it, and they took it unjustly so. Now, um, he he didn't accept the wrong done to him, but notice we don't see that he got to battle with Abimelech's men ahead of time. Apparently, he was trusting God even with their taking his well. I imagine it was pretty close in time to the taking of the well because we don't read that Abraham was digging another well or, or that he had had the, the need to come to Abimelech for water or anything like that. But we are going to see, and also I think it was quick in succession, is in verse 26, Abimelech had no idea this had happened. And that's what he retorted in verse 26. He said, I do not know who has done this thing. You didn't tell me, nor did I hear of it until today. Hey, this is the first I'm hearing of it, Abimelech saying, wait a minute, I wasn't aware of this. They didn't do this with my knowledge. They didn't come get my permission, nor did they even come tell me after it was done. You're the first that I'm hearing of it. So obviously, Abimelech was not backing his men up. He was he was saying, hey, 
yeah, that's not right. And I didn't know it. So that's why they could go on into verse 27. Abraham, notice the switch now. This is the reverse. I read you chapter 20 and verse 14, where Avimelech gave Abraham sheep and, and oxen and servants and uh, whatever all it was said there. Here's the reverse. Now Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Avimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. So first we see the material pledge. He is reciprocating kindness with kindness. Avimelech was kind to him. He's being kind back to Avimelech, and it will benefit and bless Avimelech's descendants. So he's showing a kindness there, but it's more than just showing a kindness. It's more than just giving those animals, and we're going to see maybe a reason for those animals in a moment, because the next phrase says that the two of them made a covenant. In the Hebrew, it says they cut a covenant. Now, if you remember when we studied cutting covenant back in chapter 15, we saw that Abraham took animals, cut them in half, made a path, walked through the, well, before he walked through that path, he, what normally would be done between those who were making a covenant in that day is the two making the covenant would walk through the path of the cut animals and basically we're pledging, if I break my pledge with you, let what happened to these animals be done to me. Let it be my death. That's what they're pledging when they walk through together. In Abraham's case, Abraham went to a deep sleep and God walked through alone because he was making the unconditional covenant. He would be the faithful one, whether Abraham was or not. But the very fact is the same word, cutting covenant. The very fact that that's how they did covenant in those days, except God took it onto a godly level, um, leads me to believe that they did cut animals, made the path and the two men walked through. And that probably is why he gave him sheep and oxen. They were probably with the animals that were used in the cutting of the covenant to make the sacrifice of the animals. And it, basically, Abraham was saying, I'll supply everything, but you and I will walk together through it and we'll make that pledge to each other. That's what it looks like. Can I be dogmatic? No, but I think it's a pretty good idea of what happened. Why? Maybe not with all of the animals, because we're going to see how many in a moment, but there's also um, something that comes out showing this pledge in, in the numbers. So Abraham, verse 28, set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves, ewe uh, female lambs by themselves. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, what do you mean? What, what do these seven ewe lambs mean, which you have set by themselves? Abraham set them aside. Abimelech is seeing it happening. And so he's questioning, what does this mean? He's wanting to understand what Abraham is doing. This would be culture coming with culture. This would be, you know, how God's trained Abraham. He's now going to act toward Abimelech. And Abimelech being heathen in his culture and his rituals is not privy to this. So Abraham's showing him what he's doing. Verse 70. 70. Let's try 30. There is a 70 coming in here. Sorry. <laughs> Verse 30. He said, you shall take these seven ewe lambs from my hand so that it may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Okay. How can seven lambs be a witness that Abraham is the one who dug the well? It's because of what seven means in the, the, I'll say the Hebrew culture, because Abraham is a Hebrew, he passed over from idolatry to worshiping the one true and living God. Remember, Abraham is not Jewish. And everybody who says today, oh, well, I'm Jewish because Abraham, I'm the seed of Abraham. Yeah. Well, sorry, <laughs> folks, it still doesn't make you Jewish. <laughs> that doesn't come until down the line. But here we're seeing that, that uh, uh, Abraham is dealing in his Hebraic roots. And so the number seven is a picture of completeness. It's a symbol that was sealing the covenant. It was symbolizing that Abraham would have a permanent right to this well. This was a complete deal between these two men, but this was to go on in perpetuity. It would not be that the next generation could say, oh, well, that was our dad's. That's not us. No, seven showing is a complete, is sealing the deal. The deal is to continue on. And Abraham giving those gifts that the compensation would uh, 
in in his mind, make up for uh, Avimelech losing the rights to this wealth. Now, he didn't have the rights, so here's Abraham's generosity. But Abraham knows they could have benefited from his wealth if they had fought over it and they had won the victory and had the rights to the well, it would bless those people. Whoever had that well would be blessed with the water that was needed. But Abraham wasn't fighting because he was not greedy and he wasn't miserly. He's wanting to come into, you know, let's, let's work this out to the benefit of both. So we see Abraham's character in that. And Avimelech accepting the lambs is recognizing, yes, you have given me even compensation for this well that you dug. I recognize you dug it. I recognize I really don't have a right to it, but I also see that you are gifting me. You're coming together and blessing me because I won't be blessed by this well. You're giving me a different blessing. So it was just the, the coming together, but we see a bit more as we go on. In verse 31, it tells us, therefore he called that place Be'er Sheva. You, you read Be'er, Beersheba, sorry, but Beersheba is, or Beersheba is better in the Hebrew because there the two of them took an oath. Now, Beersheba, let me break it down for you. Beer and Sheba, two Hebrew words put together. Sheba, the second part, it is, um, sorry, Sheba is seven. If I count in Hebrew, the number seven is Sheba. Okay, that's how you say it. So, Shiva is seven. Beer is a word for well. So it's saying seven wells or the well of the seven. I would think the little more accuracy is the well of the seven because <coughs> Abraham gave seven ewe lambs. That would be a blessing to, to Avi Melek. So I see it more as that because they, it wasn't that they dug seven wells. They didn't suddenly get six more wells. But it's known as the well of seven or the seven wells to this day, because you can do either way in the Hebrew language with that word. Now, I'm not quite done, but let me remind you, Beersheba is 12 hours south of Hebron, Hebron, going down toward Egypt. So that's a good ways into the desert. Um, the Dead Sea is not going to give them water down. You know, they're, they're below the Dead Sea anyway. They're going down there. Again, no rivers, nothing there. This is a real blessing that they had this oath between them, this well stays with Abraham. So he's being blessed also. He gets his well. He gives the sheep. He gives number seven to show the completeness, to show that it's it, uh, coming together completely and to continue on through generations. But then when he says in the next verse, therefore he called, the, oh, I'm in that verse. Okay, the second part of the verse, because there the two of them took an oath, the word oath, and you may even have there he swore. Okay, the, the, the reflexive in the Hebrew, which means the action coming back, I believe is what they're trying to say by reflexive. But the idea is in that word for oath, in that word for swear, in English, when you translate it, you can say to seven oneself. And if I'm saying I'm sevening myself, I'm pledging either seven sacred things, Abraham pledged seven ewe lambs, or I'm saying I'm pledging completely because seven's that completeness. So the whole thing here, this play on this words with oath, with Beersheba, with um, whatever else I, I brought in here, the, the seven in the wells, I see that this is noteworthy. It's like God saying it again and again and again, bringing it to clarity that this is a complete um, peace treaty between them. This is, they've come together, they've made this, it's a pact. It's a complete pact. No lawyers go find loopholes, okay? It's sealed up, it's complete. It stands as if he's sworn to it. And then interesting when he says he's Shiva or he's seven, he said, now think in your mind, go into the Brita Hadashan, to the new covenant, go to the time when Yeshua is walking with his Talmudim. And if I remember correctly, I was going to look it up. I believe it was Kiva. I believe it was Peter that came to Yeshua at one point and said, Lord, how many times should we forgive someone? Seven times? Did you ever ask yourself, why did he pick seven? Why didn't he say four times or 10 times? Why seven? And I think it's because of this, that sevening oneself, that making an oath, that sticking to it. Kipa was saying, 
we should forgive and we should we should really mean it and it should continue on right lord and the lord says not just seven but 70 times seven you know as, as enormous as it can be but i see in that a, a complete a whole a finish a swearing and a moving forward it's not going to be undone it's not going to come back and say oh it's not what i meant or, well, the animals have died now. No, it goes, it moves forward. And their Sheba becomes a notable place in Israel's continuing history. Even today, their Sheba is an important city in Israel. It's a very popular city now. It's got its own college and or it probably is a, it is a university. And it's got so much going for it. When I go back to my college days, my Israeli friend who was in Bible college with me lived in Beersheba. That was where his family came from. Uh, I remember seeing Beersheba in the 80s, early 80s, and if there, it was like an oasis in the desert. You came into green grass and you came into tall buildings and, you know, it's very uh, prolific. But we're going to see it real quickly. I'm going to take you through. And if you don't want to look at the, the different chapters, verses and all that I give, just listen and I'll read them to you. Uh, those of you who have cross references, they are written down on the cross references. Those of you who don't have that and want it, you can get it from me later. Just let me know. But we're going to see Beersheba quickly in scripture because again and again and again, it seems to come up. So the next place real quickly is chapter 26 of Beersheba of Genesis. Uh, it's verses 23 through 33. I'm not going to read that to you in its entirety, but I'm going to start it just to prove my point. Verse 23, then he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night. Now, who are we talking about? Here we're talking about Abraham's son, Yitzhak, Isaac. So obviously Isaac knows the story of Beersheba, knows the oath at the wells. I'm sure he drank water from this well. So we see Abraham used this well. Yitzhak, his son, used this well. Now let's see that his grandson, Yaakov, Jacob, is blessed by this well. Go to chapter 28. Genesis, whoops, chapter 28 and 28. On your own, read verses 10, 15, 15. Okay. Uh, again, then Yaakov. Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. This is when he's going to have the dream. But he stopped at Beersheba as he was leaving the promised land. He's on his way to getting his wife. He's on his way to Rachel. <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> and, and he stops at Beersheba. I'm sure he got refreshed at Beersheba. Now look when he comes back to the land. Go to chapter 46 of Genesis. Chapter 46 and verses 1 through 7. So Israel, his new name is Jacob, but his, he's now wrestled with God and God's renamed him Israel. He set out with all that he had and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Yitzhak. He's recognizing his history and he stopped at the well. It makes sense. Remember, there's not water stops everywhere. They, they would be refilling all that, that holds water. They'd be watering their animals. They needed the well and they're taking advantage of it. Now, when Israel uh, took possession of the promised land later, you know, when the, the tribes are going in because you've got 40 years wandering in the wilderness, when after it, they came out of Egypt. So we're going down the line but with the book of Yahshua, Joshua, you have the 12 tribes come into the land and each getting their allotted part of the land of Israel. This belongs to the tribe of Naphtali. This belongs to the tribe of Levi. Actually, sorry, I can't do that one because the priestly tribe didn't have land. They, they got the area around the temple and they were provided for. So let's say Asher and, and Naphtali and God, which is Gad in your English, all of these the two that got the area near this well, the area of Beersheba, are Simeon in your English, Shimon in our Hebrew, and Judah. Judah, the tribe that the Shu is going to come from, their land incorporated Beersheba, that the land that they were assigned. Joshua 15, 18, no, sorry, 1528, to prove my point. Okay, Joshua. 1528. And I'm not saying that Judah is more important than all the other tribes, but Judah does get the blessing of being the tribe that brings forth the Messiah. Uh, he had to be of the tribe of Judah. 
In Joshua 15 and verse 28, we read, and Hazar Shaol and Beersheba and, oh boy, let's see if I can do it in my Hebrew instead of in my English. Bizyot Ya, it is easier in, in, in Hebrew for once. That's the names that were given, the cities that were given. If you back up a little bit, you will see in verse 21, the cities of the outer part of the tribe of Judah toward the border with Edom. So the area that's Judah includes Beersheba. And Shimon Simeon also gets in on this area. Chapter 19 of Joshua and verse 2 is where um, Simeon in your English is going to, to, we're going to see. So they had as their inheritance Beersheba or Sheba and Mol Molada. I don't know how to say all the names. Anyway, go past that time now, past the tribes, and you have Samuel, Shmuel. You have his son or his sons were judges. Okay, so we've gone now into the time of the judges. This is a cycle of time of when Israel remembers God and forgets God and, and goes, gets into trouble, cries out, and God rises a leader up and brings them back. That we read in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, we read in chapter 8 that Samuel's son is in this area. Okay. First Samuel chapter eight and verse two. First Samuel eight two. Now the name of the firstborn was Yoel. Samuel's telling it that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. The first was Yoel. The second was Abia, and they were judging in Beersheba. So Samuel Shmuel, the one who we know anoints the king, um, God uses him in that way. Here his sons are judges in Beersheba. King Shaul, King Saul, fortified Beersheba in his battles against the Amalekites. That's still in 1 Samuel, just run over to chapter 14. And in chapter 14, we'll look at verse 48. 14 and verse 48. It takes me a while to scroll down there. Okay, there we go. He acted valiantly. He defeated the Amalekites. He delivered Israel from the hands of those who had plundered him. Um, now, that's what's happening. Go into the very next chapter. That's our background. 15 verse 2 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. And if you keep reading on down to verse 9, and I lost it in there is Beersheba. I've lost it. Wouldn't you know it? <laughs> I know it's there, folks. I did my homework. Michelle, what book was that? This is First Samuel. Okay. Yes, First Samuel 14 and 15. I'm trying to read too fast. Maybe it's just that we know it because it's telling on the way down to Egypt. I think maybe that's what it is. That it gives the area the Malachites or Pahavala as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. As it gives all these geographic places, you know that we're talking in the area of Beersheba. So I didn't remember, but apparently it's surmised there. Let's go to Eliyahu, Elijah. We're now in the time of the prophets. He found refuge at Beersheba. You know when? When he was running because of Jezebel, because the queen ordered him killed. 1 Kings 19 and verse 3. 1 Kings 19 and verse 3. And before you think that he was in the wrong and he shouldn't have run, God understood his frailty, his worn out, and God takes care of him. He doesn't condemn him. He takes care of him. Notice verse 3 now of 1 Kings 19. And he, uh, Eliyahu Elijah, was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, Judah, our tribe, and he left his servant there. So he stopped. I would imagine he refreshed himself with the well. I think that's the whole point why they headed to Beersheba was the well. And we go into the time of our prophet Amos. Amos. And in Amos, he mentions Beersheba in regard to idolatry. Let's go real quickly. If you can't find the little prophets because our books are small, then just listen. It's Amos chapter 5 and verse 5 where we read in verse 5 of Amos, Amos 5, 
but do not resort to Bethel, do not come to Gilgal, nor cross to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity and Bethel will come to trouble. Okay, there's there's idolatry coming in and there's judgment coming and he's telling them, don't go to those areas. But did you notice, don't cross over to Beersheba. Don't go there, just don't go there. Chapter eight and verse 14 of Amos, chapter eight and verse 14. And here we have, as for those who swear by the guilt of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they will fall and not rise again. So again, in regard to idolatry, we hear Beersheba's name being said. And in my closing point on this, and this expression is used to this day, I've heard it myself in regard to Israel, the phrase from Dan to Beersheba, or Dan to Beersheba is how you would hear it. That's a proverbial phrase that was used to cover the entire land of Israel. Dan was considered the most northern tribe. Shalom, Lord bless you folks. See you next week. Dan was the most northern tribe, so it was considered the north point of Israel. When you go to Israel today, they'll show you the territory and the area. It goes right up toward the border of Israel. And Beersheba, even though it's not the southernmost point, because we go all the way down, we have the lot on the, the uh, Red Sea. You know, we go a little further down than Beersheba, but that expression has still stuck. Even though Dan isn't literally the northmost point and Beersheba is not literally the south, if they say from Dan to Beersheba, they're saying from border to border, from the northern border to the southern border, everything in between is just a phrase that's used to describe Israel. I'll let you look that up on your own, but you'll see it in Judges chapter 20 and verse 1, 1 Samuel 3 and verse 20, 2 Samuel 3 and verse 10, 1 Kings 4 and verse 25, and I could go on. There's other verses also, and like I say, you even hear it today. It's, it's just very interesting. That's just a catch-all phrase that I think is because that importance of Beersheba was so established through the centuries, through time, that it's just stuck with it. So from Dan to Beersheba, may the land be blessed in your meaning everywhere. Okay, so uh, an oath is made, a swearing, uh, coming uh, to complete agreement, to come together, to, uh, to be in covenant with Avimelech is what we see taking place at this point. As we go back, I think we're ready for verse 32. Yes, this is where the two of them took the oath. And we've just talked about the oath in verse 31. So verse 32, so they made a covenant at Beersheba. And Avimelech and Pichol, his, the commander of his army, got up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Okay, they cut a covenant. <laughs> cut a covenant. Try that one fast three times. They cut a covenant. They made their, their pact. And then they got up and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Now, I'm going to talk about what that means in just a moment. But let me get to another point first real quickly. And then I'll explain that. Um, because of what we see as we read on. I want to read verse 33 for you. Um, probably I'll read to the end 34, and then I'll go back and explain a couple of things. So Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham resided in the land of the Philistines for many days. Okay, I want to tell you two different parts. I want to tell you um, that when they call this, uh, yeah, here we go. When they call it the land of the Philistines, there have been those who called out scripture and said, ah, ha, ha, we have scripture making a mistake. The Philistines weren't in this area. We're about 1900, maybe 1800 BC. The Philistines didn't come into this area until 1200 BC when we've got a great historical report of Ramses III and, and the, the Philistines coming across. Well, let me back it up and let me explain to you because scripture made no mistake. The presence of the Philistines in Israel is, is not saying, okay, I think I just said that wrong. <laughs> no, I said it right. Okay. The presence of the Philistines was there. It didn't mean that the Philistines owned that land and it was all their land as it came to be in time. But you've got to remember how the name Philistine even came about. So, the ones who get credit 
for calling it this, the not calling. Okay. I'm really saying this poorly. Sorry, forgive me. I've got too much wrapping around my brain to try to get out. Um, all right. <clears throat> Let's put it this way. There were little groups that came to be known as Philistines. They were not all together. They were not entirely, they didn't cover and blanket the whole land. The whole area was theirs. But in these earlier times, there were these people. They were non-Semitic people. They were referred to in scripture as the uncircumcised. And I'll show you that in a few moments. They settled in the plain and the low hill country of southwestern, what comes to be called Palestine. Now, the great invasion of Israel's original enemy, the Philistines, that great invasion that did take place about 1200 BC. As I said, Ramses III of Egypt, there was a great invasion of the Sea Peoples, S-E-A, because they came by the Mediterranean, they came by the sea, and they settled in that area, and they grabbed that area. They had a knowledge of metallurgy, which means they knew how to work with metalworks, with iron. That meant they could build weaponry. So small numbers were very powerful. They were powerful against bigger numbers because they had weapons, because they knew how to work with metal and they had metal that was available to them. So really the Philistines and the name given Philistines as the enemy of Israel, we see it from, we see the beginnings at this time. By the time you have Samson in the areas of the Philistine, all the way through the middle of David, David's reign, you have the Philistine people that gave their name to that land. You have them as the main enemy. We see many times that they came up against the Philistines, they came up against the Philistines, they came up against the Philistines. Now, the land finally is called Palestine. It's called Palestine because that's a, just, just a break off of the root of Philistine. You can even hear in the two words in our English how closely related they are. But my point is, when it was came to be called Palestine, it was a slur at Israel. Israel had gone down in defeat of the Romans. 70 AD had happened. The temple had been destroyed. We go into 132 um, AD, and you have the last of three revolts, 70 AD, there was a smaller one in, in the middle, and then 132 AD was the final, the Bar Kokhba revolt. It's even just been recognized on the Jewish calendar as the time that it just happened. It was Monday night on our calendar that, that we're still marking time by revolt. The third try had to take down, and they were revolted, lost their battle, it was declared that that Titus had won. He had marched the Jews that, that he wanted for slaves into Rome. Remember the Arch of Titus? He put up that Arch of Victory, and he was saying, all the Jews are out of their land now. They'll, they'll, they'll cease being a people. I've won. We stood there and pointed four feet back at Israel that were Jewish and said, no, you didn't, Titus, and we've gone back. <laughs> but at this time, with that destruction, then Titus, Rome, renamed the area. They're the ones who called it Palestine for the first time. They called it that to say to Israel, nah, 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 the Philistines got you. And they renamed Jerusalem Ela Capitolina. They kept these names while Rome was in control. When Rome loses its power, then you have a little bit of change and you don't hear the name Aelia Capitolina carried on, but you hear the name Palestine carried on, carried on, carried on until finally in 1948, when Israel is reborn as a nation and declares the name of the state to be Israel, not to be Palestine, but to be Israel. They declared it because this is what God called it. God called it Israel back, all the way back. And that was prior to the Philistines. And that was prior to Rome. And that was the real name. And it wasn't Israel becoming a new nation in 1948. Israel was becoming the reborn nation. Reborn in a day, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. Yeshaya, Isaiah 66, that said the nation would be, would be born in a day. That even before the mama gave, had birth pains, the baby, the male child would be born. And we know that it was a picture of Israel, of course, also a picture of our Messiah coming in his reign. 
But that's where that name comes from. And it's because of these Philistines. It's because they were even in territories as far back as Abraham's day, but they're not known as the people called Philistines until about Samson's time, about the from Samson into the middle of David's reign. Yes, Rowena. So um, here in Genesis 21, when they mention the Philistines, are this a separate group of people from the Philistines that Samson was fighting off? They're the ancestors of them. They're the, they come out of them. So they were like little um, little spurts, little groups of them, but it was the same, the same line, you know, the same people that that yes, that Samson. Are they also are they also part of the Canaanites that God said to Joshua, you have to eradicate them? All the Perizzites, Can Canaanites, Jebusites, are they part of them? Yes, I would answer yes to that. Um, they're, they're not all of them. All of those were seven different nations that came from seven different areas, but the Philistines would have been part of that, yes. Um, and I would think because we're not told, they weren't called Canaanites, they were called, you know, all the different names, that they would have been the Canaanites because they were in the land of Canaan, Canaan. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So I would put them in that category, the, the, the Canaanites that were kicked out of that land, that uh, they, there were these small little groups of them carrying big weight because they had weaponry on their side, but that's all that they are. They were not, um, they were, they, well, they're the ones that God said, I'm casting out. So they don't have any right to the land. So these people today, and without going political, but it, I have to just say it, these people today that call themselves Palestinian, that want to say that gives them a right to this land because the land of Palestine was theirs. Well, hello, the land of Palestine was really the land of Israel. You can call a rose a gardenia that is still a rose. It's going to smell like a rose and it's going to look like a rose. It doesn't become a gardenia, it, no matter what you call it. You can call it an orange and it's still what it is. Palestine was what it, it was called to be, to, to just jab at Israel, to just poke a finger in their eye. It'd be like somebody taking over, kidnapping your baby and saying, your baby is mine now. And well, they did it. They did it to Dan and Danielle and the others. They changed their names. You don't even get to have your original name. So it was it was the enemy coming against. And in scripture, often they were called, as I said, uncircumcised people. Let me give you just two quick examples. Um, I've got a lot more in your cross references and I'll say them for the sake of the video. But let's just look real quickly in Judges chapter 14 and verse three. Um, because I want you to see if the name was there all the way back, because these people today say, we're mentioned in the Bible, it was our land. No, it was the land that God gave to Abraham, to Abraham's descendants. It was the land that God put his name on, it's the land that he called Israel. When the vote came up in 1948, what they were going to call it, it came down to two, it came down to either be called Israel or Zion. Zion's another name for Yerushalayim. And we do see Zion in scripture, but not quite in the same way. And I remember hearing those who were old enough to be around in that vote, that they said they knew what the outcome of that vote was going to be because God had already named it. And sure enough, that the outcome of that vote was to call it Israel because they were drawing right back on what God had said and what God had called. Judges 14, it's not the right verse. Oh, I went to Jude in my tablet. Sorry. <laughs> Judges chapter 14 and verse 3. And we have, yeah, that looks a lot better. Then his father and his mother said to him, they're talking to Samson. Okay. In fact, verse 1 says that he wanted one of the daughters of the Philistines. Here's the name of the people that are known because by now we've had that major invasion. We've had, we're down about 1200 BC. We have the time that the, the Philistines were running over this whole area. And Samson wants one of them for his wife. And his father and his mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives, among all of our people, that you go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Really? You 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 want to go to the uncircumcised? You want to go to the Philistines? And you'll hear that used that way with the, the name Philistine 
many times in scripture. Judges 15, 18, 1 Samuel 14, 6, 1 Samuel 31, 4, 2 Samuel 1 and verse 20, and 1 Chronicles 10 and verse 4. Uncircumcised, uncircumcised, uncircumcised. And remember the uncircumcised were those apart from the commonwealth of Israel. They would be the heathen peoples. They were not those of the, the land. Well, not the land, but the God of Israel. I'm going to put it that way. If you didn't have your son circumcised, he was kicked out of the blessings of Israel. It was that serious. It, it meant death basically to their son if they didn't circumcise their son. So when they're called uncircumcised, it's those out of the heathen nations. They were not a part of, of who God called out and God gave circumcision to Abraham as that sign. And he circumcised his son Ishmael and he was circumcised the two on the same day. Abraham was 99. And then you have it continue on on the eighth day of every child's male child's birth in Israel. So um, I lost my thought, but I think I probably have declared it. So you understand the Bible didn't make a mistake. It knew that these little groups were Philistine people. They were kind of like the forerunners for those who followed them. They got a foothold and then others came in and you have a huge wave come in that history recognizes in about 1200 BC. But there were there were roots of them what five no six seven hundred years earlier because 1800 1900 bc we're in that time so you know several hundred years is a long time people do proliferate they do populate and there were more philistines in the area there were more that came in and that that, that came in through the sea and marauded the land that's what we're referring to so Israel was right on top. I mean, the scriptures are right on. There's no mistake in the scriptures. Um, when they were the leading enemy of Israel from the time of Samson to the middle of the reign of David, I gave you that. Look in 1 Samuel 13. Look especially at verses 19 and 21 into relation to that. And then I want to bring you also, um, just to, to read it again, Isaiah chapter 14. Oh, I'm in that. Okay. Let me get where I can see it. Uh, you you were at Judges 14. Now go to Isaiah, Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 14. Or Yeshahu, actually a little more accurate in my pronunciation. Verses 29 and 31. And here we read, do not rejoice, O Philistia. That's Philistines just in the feminine. All of you, because the rod that struck you is broken. Don't rejoice because the ones that came against you lost. For from the serpent's root, a viper will come out, and its fruit will be a flying serpent. Verse 31, wall, O gate, cry, O city, melt away, O Philistia, all of you. For smoke comes from the north, and there's no staggler in his ranks. God was warning Philist Philistia, Philistines, you think you're victor? You're not going to stay victor. You are going to see defeat also. That's chapter 14 of Isaiah, verses 29 and 31. Um, also, in this area, the people that came from Homs line, Ham, Homs line, through Nimrod, these people, and that's Genesis 10, 14, and they're listed there. They settled at various times along the seacoast, and they probably came from Crete, which is off in the Mediterranean, um, overway. I get my geography mixed up, but look for Crete, and you'll see it, okay? I can come back and tell you better later. Again, this is when Palestine, the name is being given to that area. And these people that came through Homs line, they intermixed with Japheth's line. The two sons, you know, you had the three sons of Noah and Shem, where the Jewish people is their line. They're the Semitic people. Then you had Japheth or Yapha, his line, and you had Homs line. Ham had the Arab nations. Uh, Yapha's descendants went out in similar areas, but they went in different areas, but they were close enough, there wasn't intermixing. So even though Ham's line was rebellious toward God, Yafa's line, Japheth's line had, they knew who their God was. So when those lines mixed and you had those families come together, it's basically what you see today. 
when you see someone who is a believer marry into a family of unbelievers, well, the believer will tell a little bit of, of the truth. They'll bring it with them. There's a mix there. It's not what God says to do. God speaks against this in scripture. So even though I'm giving it as an example, I'm not saying this is right and this is what to do. That you do have uh, that, that, that this line, the, these peoples had some knowledge of God because they got it from Japheth, from his line. And so when it tells us also in verse 32, back in Genesis, that they returned, Abimelech and Pico returned to the land of the Philistines, there weren't fixed boundaries yet. Maybe that's the way to put it, like we, we came to see, especially when they got near the desert area, the wilderness area. Beersheba did not belong to Gerar. The kingdom of Abimelech was near and was around, but you kind of, you know, you, you the borders were haphazard because they're nomadic border lines that are being drawn. And the people would kind of claim a certain area, but you didn't have the city government come in and draw the lines and have the maps that you could go to City Hall and say, this is where your territory ends. This is where your territory begins. So you have a little of the overlapping in the areas where the influence maybe went past their borders, but it wasn't their land. We see that with this well. The influence of the Philistines went into Beersheba. That's why Avi Malik's men felt like they could grab that well. Well, this is, you know, it's close enough. It's our territory too. We can claim this land. We're bigger and we're tougher than you. But God didn't let that happen. God put a stop to it. Abraham gets the rights to the well that he had um, dug himself. But you can begin to see how there's a blending, how there's a mixing. It wasn't cut and dry in all this area. And you begin to see the Philistine people grow who are going to become those main enemies against Israel from, we'll say, from Samson to um, into King David's reign. So um, I think I covered it all. I think I've given you the geography of it, the people of it, the area of it. You can begin to see and understand what this area was like at this, at this time. Now, what I want to do is go back, and we're not going to get quite as far as I thought, but I think I can do this for you also. We want to go back because we skipped a line in here, and I want to bring something out very interesting in that, okay? Um, but I want to give you that complete thought, the area, the Philistines, and all. Um, and that Abraham resided in the land of the Philistines. See, people will jump on that and say, well, then that's Palestine. Abraham, it wasn't his land, it was the Palestinian people, they've got the right to the land. But again, you have to remember how the name develops and that Palestine and Philistine are not the same people. It's the same root word gives the name, but they're not the same people. Um, yes, the Palestinian people are of Arab descent, but all those countries, probably a mix of countries from, go back and where you will find their family trees and their family lines and all of that. But what we skipped in there was in verse 33. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. That's a beautiful verse, and I want us to pull it out and to see it. The very fact that Abraham is planting a tree, that's indicating settling in. That's indicating continuing. Remember, he's been very nomadic. He has sojourned. He started up in the north of Israel. He's moved on all the way down toward the south of Israel now. But now we see, and I'll put it this way, he's putting down roots, okay? Planting a tree, get it? <laughs> he's rooting himself. Roger, could you refill me, please, at some point? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. He's that was right today. He what? He's rooting for himself, <laughs> Roger says. Okay, we played with the word. But the idea is he's no longer looking at himself as a stranger in the land. He's now taking possession. He's a possessor of the land. He's built, He's put, planting a tree. He. You, how long does it take a tree to grow? You don't plant one day and see a full-grown tree in a week or a month. That takes time. It takes years to see. Thank you. And in fact, in Israel today, the first three years of the planting of a fruit tree, you don't eat the fruit off of the tree. 
In the fourth year, you give the fruit all to the Lord. It's in the fifth year that they get to eat from the tree. That's later than Abraham's time. I'm not telling you that about him plus the tamarisk tree. I don't believe it's a fruit tree, but just giving you an idea. Trees take time. If you're going to plant a tree, you're planning on staying there. You're not planting a tree and you're going to leave in a month or two when the green grass is over there. Okay, so we see that he's making a change. Why is he making that change now? He's got an heir now, H-E-I-R. He's got a son now. He's beginning to want to put down roots for himself, for his son's sake, beginning to say, you know, I need to develop something to pass on to my son that will be his, and then he can grow with it and, and move on. So he's beginning to provide for Yitzhak's future. He's looking toward the future, and he's feeling less like he's supposed to keep moving and more like it's time to settle. Why could he think that? Because what did God promise him? Did God promise him this land for 50 years? Did God promise him this land only for his lifetime? Now, God said it would be for Abraham and for his descendants forever. Well, is forever up yet? <laughs> Last time I checked, forever outdates me <laughs> and you <laughs> and everybody else. So Abram had a right. God had made a promise. He's beginning to take God at that promise. This is the land that God promised, and he's beginning to settle in. Now, when we look at the, um, by the way, if you have the King James Version that uses the word grove, that was a word used interchangeably for the word tree. So if it says they planted a grove, in my mind, it makes me think a whole bunch of trees. And I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if Abraham did one little sapling or if he did several, if he made a row. Uh, you know, e either way, we know that, that he planted a tree. And the tree also is the picture of everlasting to us. We think of trees as continuing on. The tamarisk tree is known as a tree that's long lived. It's hard wood. It's very long and narrow. It has thickly clustered evergreen leaves. Notice evergreen, everlasting. They're always green. They don't go through the cycle where they turn colors and fall off the tree and grow new ones. They're the evergreens. And it would be a type or a picture then of the everlasting grace of the faithful covenant keeping God. That's why they believe that it was this tree that was planted was to be a picture of that. Just how God uses everything as pictures. You know, we're just seeing more to it. The Hebrew calls it an eshel, E-S-H-O-L or E-S-H-E-L, depending on which source you go from. Because remember, our vowels aren't in Hebrew. And why is it called an eshel tree? And is an eshel tree a tamarisk tree? And I will tell you, I don't know, <laughs> but I can tell you what Eshel means in the Hebrew and why I think, you know, the Tamarisk is fine because it's a good picture of it also. If we take that word Eshel, we think that it's an acronym, that you take the letters, and I'm going to show you the letters. I brought them with my nice big uh, flashcards now, okay? Wow. Eshel is spelled with an olive. The letter sheen, I think that one you'll remember. You may not remember the olive, but the letter sheen. And then it has a lamed, the L sound. And it almost looks like if I took part of it off, you could have an L there. It might help you remember what the letter looks like. So if we've got these three letters and it's an acronym, then what are we learning from Eshel? The olive sound, the sheen sound, and the L sound. Okay, lamed. Okay. The E, that olive, and E and A, remember, you can spell either way depending on the pronunciation. You look at dots today to tell you how to pronounce it in Hebrew, but if you don't have the dots, you had to learn or it had to be passed down to you how to say it. Like Elohim, yes, that we spell that with an E. Um, usually when we say olive, we spell it with an A, but when we say ashal, we spell it with an E, and you really don't hear a difference, do you? That's what I'm trying to say. So if, if we're doing it right, the olive, that first letter, 
could stand for the word akila. I'm not going to spell it all out. It's just a Hebrew word. And that word means eating, e eating, eating, we're eating. Okay. We like to eat. Okay. Akila. The sheen sound that that one that looks kind of like our W, the sh sound would stand for the word shia. Shia is drinking. Okay. So we're eating and we're drinking. And then our L the, the Lama, the L sound would stand for a Levia. Now, I'm not even sure I pronounced all the words right in Hebrew. If someone knows Hebrew and I slaughtered them, forgive me. But um, Levia, if I'm saying it right or not, means accompanying along the way. So when we put these together, the eating and the drinking and accompanying along the way, it gives the idea that this was a, a place to temporarily lodge, like we call it a guest house or an inn. That was a place to come in for some refreshing, for some food and some drink, and then you're helped along your way. And remember when Abraham served the, the three who came before him, he hurried and he made them a meal, and then he walked with them along the way when they went to leave. That's the hospitality at that time. So what may be being said by using the word eshel is Abraham might have done a whole lot more than plant a tree. He may have made like a guest in. He may have made a place of refuge for people. Remember, they're in the desert. When you're traveling on this way, he had the well to water the trees. He had a place to bring them in and give them a little refuge out of that hot sun. And that, that's who he was, that he was being hospitable. And he would have made delicacies for them to eat. And he would have been able to use this time and this opportunity to speak to them about the one true and living God. Remember, we hear that they heard about Abraham's God. And we know that that would be carried on. And Abraham could be teaching them and telling them about Sarah and how God protected her, how God brought them together, how God provided Yitzhak. And they would see an old man and an old woman. And here's the young one. They would see evidence to it. Now, I cannot tell you dogmatically that's what he did, because in our English, what's come to us, we cannot see all of that. But I can tell you there's room for that in the picture that is painted by the Hebrew words that were used. And there are some that will give it slightly different words and different meanings. But the whole idea is the same. The refreshing, the, the renewing of you, of you physically, the helping along the way. And I'm sure Abraham would speak anywhere and everywhere of his experiences about his God. Now, one difference that I'll point out. There were areas called groves. Remember I said the word could be grove, and it makes me think of many trees. Well, we know as we go down in time in scripture, we're going to see that in the groves, in the area of trees, an area where they maybe had a, a hut or a place of refreshing, a lodge or whatever, that they also used that in idolatry, that they made altars to false gods and they worshiped those false gods in those areas. I'll take that to today and tell you whether it's similar or not. What it made me think of is, especially in my teen years, we knew that an area city near us, I'm not going to give its name on here, but you all who are local will know, had many orange trees, many orange groves. And we all knew there was a lot of satanic worship that went down in those groves, in those trees at night. So if Abraham knew that, you know, there he saw others make a place of refreshing that was for a bad reason. I could see him saying, hey, I'll give a place where you can come where it's not connected to heathendom, where it's not connected to worshiping a false god. And he does not make an altar to his God here, yet we know he made many altars along the way to his God. And this verse told us very clearly there he called on the name of the Lord the everlasting God. And I'm going to see if that's a question. Yes. Okay. Then go ahead before I go on. Doesn't the middle letter uh, looks like uh, the triune or whatever? Yes. It's called. Yes. That's the letter that God uses the shin to stand for himself because we see the triunity one base, but three parts. Yes. So yes, absolutely. It's the so letter God uses. Is that what it means in, in that word? Well, God uses that letter to stand for himself, but if the word standing for, for their drinking, meaning refreshing, not meaning alcohol, but 
but a refreshing drink from the well. And where would they get their water for that, that lodge? You know they got it from Avraham's well. And I can tell you, I drunk from Jacob's well. Oh, is that good water. Oh, wee. Yes. I mean, wow. You you taste that and, and everybody's like, ah. <laughs> you know, it, it, the well water is amazing. Amazing, at least in Israel. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, it, it, he's not saying it's the house of God because he didn't put an altar there. But he is going to represent his God there. If he had a lodging place for people, I'm sure he talked to them. I'm absolutely sure that's who Abraham would be telling him about how God brought him on this journey. How did you come to this place, Abraham? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. You know, we've got a few hours this evening. Refresh yourself. Stay overnight. Let me tell you the story. And then they go on their way knowing about the one true and living God. And he has 107 years to go. So you, you need to give him a little bit of time. <laughs> so again, whether that's what it was or not, I don't know. But I find it very interesting. And I definitely see room for it in our Hebrew. Here's where we know that whatever, whether it was a tree, whether it was trees, Abraham's beginning to put down a place for himself or whether it's for himself and others. We know that here he called on the name of the Lord. He's not walking away from his God. He's not in disobedience to his God. His God had told him, sojourn through the land. He has done that. And now he's calling on the name of the Lord. The word Lord there is Jehovah. That's the covenant keeping God. So he's calling on the name of God, the, you, the one who made covenant, kept covenant with me, the one who's keeping covenant. But then he doesn't stop there. He says the everlasting God. And here's where it ties back into that tamarisk tree also being an everlasting, evergreen. We begin to see that picture. In Hebrew is El Olam. It's E-L, that's, that's God. And the everlasting part, O-L-A-M. L, the just when you say just L alone, that's might, that's strength, that's power. When you put it with Olam and you put it together, Olam is used in several different ways. It talks about the secret or the hidden things. In this case, it would be the mysterious nature of our God. We can't quite figure our God out because we're finite and he's infinite. So it's attributing to, to God, wow, you are mis mystique, you are mystery, you are beyond our understanding. At the same time, it's also standing for that indefinite age, that age that just never ends, that time that continues on. So it's like, God, you continue on forever. I don't get that. How do you not have a beginning? How do you not end? El Olam, you are mighty, strong, powerful, and everlasting, and you are the covenant-keeping God. That's what Abraham is saying, all of that in this phrase. He's giving praise to this God, this God who is eternal in duration, this God that, that one said, it, it, the, the name is, is still running, and it's not running out. It's never going to run out. It's going to keep on keeping on. This is the one who has planned the mystery of the ages. Do we understand that? Can we fathom that? Can you really comprehend? Just go back to Donnie. Go back. Given a prophecy that still. How did God do that? And in such exact detail that we know will be filled out. Those living in the tribulation time, they can open the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and put those two together and say, we know what's coming next. And we know when it's going to end. We need to go into hiding and we need to be able to survive in hiding X amount of years. If it's at the beginning, they need to hide seven years. If it's in the middle, they need to hide for three and a half more years, but they can know it all. How did God do that? How did God name Cyrus 150 years before Cyrus was born? And he's born to a heathen mama, not to a mama who's saying, God, what should I name my child? He's born to a mama that doesn't know God of Israel and says she's going to call him Cyrus. How does God do that? How does, I mean, the mysterious nature of our God is amazing and it is everlasting what was god doing before he created this earth how did he create it out of nothing 
How does he keep it all in order? How does he keep control of 7 billion people? I guess we're up to eight now or just about on the face of this earth all at the same time. How can I pray to him in English while somebody's praying to him in Swahili while another one's praying to him in Spanish while another one's praying in Hebrew? And it's all crisis moments. And he takes care of every crisis in split second perfect timing. God, how do you know what's going to happen? How do you make it happen? How do you do that? And we're not your puppets, but we're moving according to your will. Amazing God. But was Cyrus a uh, mother? Did she know God? Or not the God of Israel? To she, this was a Persian mama. Mm -hmm. Cyrus is raised in the Persian Empire, so there's no reason to believe that that she would have. No, but God knew. God said. God told. God names babies sometimes. He named Yitzhak, Yitzhak. He named Ishmael, Ishmael. Yes, I mean, you know, whether you're a believer or not, it's just weird. Because name. God's in control and he's planned it all. You didn't need a sonogram back then to find out whether you're carrying a boy or a girl. Not if God taught you and told you, here's the name. He knew what you were carrying. But this, this is an amazing God. And this God, this God of eternality, this God who's, years before and i can't even say years because that's a time and he's beyond time but before abraham and will be years after abraham even though i have to take it out of that realm how do i say it but he still made an eternal covenant with abraham and abraham's descendants how has that happened how did they get kicked out of their land in in the first century a.d and they didn't get back in their land until 1948. Give me another people out of their land that long that are still a people. Where are the Malachites? Where are the Kenzanites? Where are the Canaanites? Where are the Hittites? Where are the Gergeshites? I can name you again and again and again. They're gone. How did Israel remain Israel? How did a Jew remain a Jew? almost 2,000 years without having a land to be their own, to nurture and to grow up Israelis and to be safe. How safe was the Jew in 1930, 1940? There's a big difference in those two years. And that's just our slice of history that we can relate to because we have grandparents or parents that can tell us firsthand, what about going back 2,000 years. Wow. Wow. What a God. What a God who so gives Daniel the timeline that as Adrian Rogers, great Baptist preacher who's in heaven now and has all the answers, said, if the people had known their scriptures, they should have rented out all the hotel rooms in Jerusalem. They should have been front line and center there to welcome in their king. They should have been able to know everything. They shouldn't have had that. Who is he that they had? That is because they didn't know their scriptures because what God said happens. That's an amazing, powerful, almighty, everlasting God who made covenant with Abraham. Can you imagine how Abraham felt? Why me, God? I'm in a land of idolatry. And you plucked me out and you put my feet in this land. And you said, this is for you. This is for Yitzhak. This is for Yaakov. This is for my son, the son of the living God, capital S, who is going to come through your line in this land. That's an amazing God. And I'm going to leave you in the amazing point and tell you, when we come back next week, I'll bring back this Hebrew in a little bit because I want to bring you to another Hebrew word. Next week, you're going to be introduced to a word that you know well. It's the first time the words are used in scripture. I'm going to let you do your homework and go read and see if you can pick out what's coming. We're ready. We're, we're, we're poised to jump right into chapter 22. And wow, what a chapter. This is an amazing chapter 
that right off at the beginning, it starts with something mentioned. It's the first mention of it in scripture. What's the word? That's your homework. Huh? That's your homework. <laughs> and then I'm going to tell you what it means in Hebrew. <laughs> and when I get done with that, if you think you're overwhelmed right now, that's why I want to bring you back. I'll start next week with our eternal covenant keeping God in his name. This name, this phrase here, I'll remind us of the Lord, the everlasting God that Abraham called on. And then I'll bring you to this word. And I'll bring that together in a meeting that will touch you where you live in 2022. Where are we? 2023. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say something and the smart ones will catch me. You're going to love this word. I'm leaving it there. I'm not answering the question. <laughs> if you're smart, you've got the answer. If you're really smart, I just made it easier. <laughs> but I want you to come back next week, and we are way past time. So we're going to end on this high note of who our God is, how in control he was, and how he protected Abraham, how he carried him to this point, how he put into his heart to put down a root here. And what that's going to mean. And when we come into chapter 22, if you don't know what happens in chapter 22, take a sneak peek and you'll say, oh, okay. I'll tell you the Hebrew word is Akita, but you probably don't know what Akita means without looking. That's not the word I'm going to explain. I'm not giving you the answer to that question. I'm just telling you the whole chapter 22 is about the Akita. It's an amazing chapter. Oh my goodness. This, this chapter explodes up for Messiah. That's, that's come back next week. If this was good today, next week's going to be on steroids. <laughs> Don't miss it. All of God's word is. Let's close in prayer. We'll open up the mics. Lord God of Israel, the covenant keeping L L uh, L L sorry, L O long, our everlasting God, how we praise and thank you that the same God evident in Abraham's life is the same God evident in our life today. And we can trust you because you are as faithful to us as you were then. Thank you for your faithfulness, your completeness, for the complete perfect picture we see in the number seven that speaks of your perfectness, your completeness. Lord, thank you. We stand in awe and amazement at the depth of the scripture burn it into our hearts, open our minds to receive and understand it on more levels. And Lord, thank you that you keep your promises. Thank you that we can stand sure and strong and firm. You are the rock of our salvation. As we go into this next week, no matter whether we face trials or jubilant victories, Lord, let us remember the rock of our salvation and that you are from everlasting to everlasting. Hallelujah. Worthy of praise, worthy of honor, worthy of all, and so much more. My words are too small, Lord. Thank you. In the name of our precious Messiah, our Savior, Yeshua Jesus, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What a God. Hoo-hoo. And just wait. Wait till we explode next week. <laughs>